I'm Nathan Waters. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about, um, so I think the topic was going to be like blockchain and automation. So it's like you can either go deep into the rabbit hole of either one of those. So I'm kind of just going to like lightly touch on just both and, and probably more the blockchain type thing and automating on the blockchain rather than, you know, I'm not going to cover AI, I don't think. I'm not going to cover robotics. So we're going to keep it nice and simple and we'll kind of explain what blockchain is. Oh. He's still going to do that, it's still early. So, so blockchain is kind of like web point, you know, 3.0. So you know how it's like web 2.0, that's kind of like social media. So web 3.0 is really about like decentralizing the web uh, back to what its original state was, but you know, just making it a lot more intelligent um, and basically restructuring it in such a way where it doesn't get, you know, uh, <laughs> co-opted, uh, hopefully again, like has already happened with the current web with, you know, most of the web is dominated by the platforms we all visit every day, you know, YouTube, Facebooks, Amazons. Um, it's a pretty shitty place from what it used to be in the 90s, when it was this free utopian, like everyone had the same power and, and same kind of equality and, you know, beautiful system. So, <laughs> so blockchain, um, I'm sure you've probably all heard about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, you know, Ether, all these, all these massive, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies that went mad last year with the, with the, with the crazy bubble. So the, the underlying technology that powers all of them and the reason why people are excited about this beyond the whole hype and making money is blockchain technology, which is really about a decentralized ledger, a decentralized database. Um, there's so many different ways you can think of it. It's, it's, I tend to notice that people, you know, they, they'll click on it from a certain different direction. So I think depending on like probably your, your demographic, your age, your background, who you hang around with and what industry you're in, you'll come to realize that blockchain is awesome for different reasons. Um, and so it's really hard to explain in a concise sentence why blockchain is awesome and what it is. <laughs> um, but so the one I typically use is, is it's kind of like a, um, it's almost like trying to turn the entire internet into a single global computer. So think like a giant open shared database, a giant uh, open shared computing platform that anyone can access, anyone can use freely without asking for permission from anyone. Um, and it's got, decentralization built into it. So what that means is you don't have centralized actors having control over any particular point of the network. Um, and that, that extends like down to the physical, like the, the, the code, the, the actual underlying blockchain architecture and all the applications that sit on top of that as well. Um, and so a few other things you can think of is like sort of distributed, uh, a bit like say torrents, you know, probably we all use torrents in this room. Um, I still use torrents even though Netflix is out because they're easier. <laughs> um, it's immutable, so the other thing is that it's, it's basically this permanent ledger. You can't really change what gets added to the blockchain. So it's always adding and, and, and building up this massive kind of ledger, which has some issues, because I think right now the Ethereum ledger is something like a couple of terabytes. Um, so they're looking at trying to shard it and do all these other kind of you know, fancy things. And it's also global and it's also public. So think like open data, this open access, just this beautiful system that what the web was meant to be in the beginning. <clears throat> um, and one of the things that, so Bitcoin is really all about mostly just transacting. Um, so the, the big thing that Bitcoin solved was a double spend problem. And that allows you to you know, make sure that when I send you money and someone else sends you money, like you know, make sure all the balances are basically correct. So you can have a decentralized banking system, finance system without having you know, a bank in the middle. Um, other platforms like Ethereum and a whole bunch of other ones that are launching now, they're really all about trying to turn that into a true and complete um, computing platform. So you can create literally any application you want um, and, and deploy it to this decentralized blockchain thing. Um, you can probably call that the cloud. I think we should start maybe, you know, I think for the average person, when this starts getting to the mainstream, I think the blockchain will probably be called the cloud because there's a real definition of the cloud, not the cloud as in on Amazon servers or Google servers. The cloud um, chain. The cloud chain. <laughs> or Web 3.0. I actually think the word blockchain might maybe go away, but who knows. Um, so these are the, this is the thing that's actually on, this, on Ethereum. So you, they're called smart contracts. Um, it's, it's basically just a tiny little piece of code. Um, so this, this contract right here is just literally a Hello World contract. And when you call this, so you, you write this code, you deploy it to either the testnet or the mainnet or Ethereum. And if you call this, if you deploy this contract, you then get a, an address. So this is, this would be, say, um, this can either be a personal wallet address or it can be an address to a specific contract that you've deployed. So when you deploy things, everything almost has like an identifier so you can point to it. Uh, a bit like an IP address, but a bit different. 
Um, and then by calling this address, say I deploy this contract to this address, and this happens to be the address it gives me back, um, then I can then call this and call this function and it will kick out hello world. Which is like, yeah, cool, what, you can do that with any like, any application, any website type programming thing, but the cool thing is it's like not running on any servers anywhere. It's not running, you know, it's running across this distributed system where all these miners are, are sharing their computational resources um, to, to basically run this code. So that's really cool. So dApps are decentralized applications so that's going to be a big term you're going to hear more of, and I think that's, that'll be something that'll kind of get into the mainstream. People understand what dap, uh, apps are, so dApps is just decentralized apps. Um, and so things like apps that basically plug into this, this blockchain system at the back end. So another cool thing is this concept called decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs. Um, or sometimes they're called DACs, like De decentralized autonomous corporations. Um, and so these, depending on who you talk to, these kind of have a very different definition. Um, so there was, if you, if you followed the news for the past couple of years, there was a big thing called the DAO. Um, and that concept um, was basically the idea where, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a venture fund where everyone could, you could get you know, 10,000 people invest in this venture fund, pull a whole bunch of funds, and then each of them would get voting rights on what the, where those funds go. So they were basically going to use those funds to vote on um, projects to fund, Typically, like other Ethereum projects, and but the, the kind of the shareholders always got to vote, so it's almost like a decentralized venture fund or a decentralized seed fund. The problem is, it got hacked and it lost about 150 million dollars or something like that, <laughs> and they basically shut it down. And then that caused this massive issue where you know this big uh, ideological battle between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, um, because they were basically saying that well. If it's on Ethereum, the code should run the same way every single time. Like, code is law, code is truth. And then when they suddenly said, well, no, that guy stole the funds, so we should fork the, the chain because that isn't exactly what we wanted. And anyway, go look it up, it's interesting. Um, so DAOs are really, really cool because, so that, that particular idea is one way people buy into it and they have voting rights. That's kind of like one definition of DAOs. The definition I always kind of took, and I don't think it's really that common, um, is more the idea of like, just literally like autonomous entities that just are completely autonomous and run on the blockchain. Um, they don't even have to have owners. They can have, they literally can own themselves. So you can think like a whole series of smart contracts. So that one before where they basically just kicked out a hello world, you could have that, that same contract or a series of those contracts linked together. They could do decentralized insurance, decentralized Uber, decentralized, all sorts of decentralized marketplaces. Um, pretty much anything, <laughs> anything that runs our society right now. Yeah, sorry? AI? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, merging AI and blockchain is like another massive thing. Um, particularly with these, because if these things, you know, these things are essentially like <coughs> AIs that you can never, ever, ever shut down, <laughs> which is scary in some sense. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when the Ethereum uh, white paper was going around, a lot of people were calling it Skynet um, <laughs> back in 2014. Uh, so, so yeah, if you do pair AI with this, that's going to be quite amazing and quite scary. The good thing right now is the blockchain, like all blockchain, te blockchain technology is incredibly shit. It's really slow. It can't, it's got really, really slow um, transaction times. So, and this is, this is the problem. Like it's got these, ma these, they've got these massive valuations and there's a bunch of hype, but the technology, what it can do today is very, very limited. So you got to kind of look at like what the potential future of that technology will be when we get transaction times that aren't, you know, three minutes or ten seconds or you know when they're down to like milliseconds and you can be like, do this thing and it just happens in this decentralized global computer thing. Um, yeah. So the other cool thing with this is the idea that well you can have things own themselves. You can have objects own themselves. Um, and this kind of like doesn't really fit into DAOs, but it's kind of the same idea. Um, so you could have, say, you know, self-driving cars. So everyone, mostly everyone agrees that self-driving cars will happen at some point, if they're long enough time frame. Um, so you'll have a, an Uber self-driving car driving around, picking up people, transporting them around, and charging them a fee. It'll be a low fee, but charging them a fee. Well, that car could have its own wallet address, that, that same address I showed before, um, where it could collect funds and that car could own itself on the blockchain and it could have <coughs> smart contracts attached to it where um, 
whenever it drives someone around, it charges them, it goes into the, the bank account wallet address of the car that the car actually owns, and it could have a smart contract system set up so that it can automatically book itself in for maintenance, it can automatically have some type of uh, maybe a life insurance policy for itself in case it like, you know, gets stuck in a ditch and humans aren't willing to help it out, so it just puts a call out and, you know, a, a, a mechanic comes and helps it out. So yeah, like imagine cars that own themselves, like literally. Wow. I mean, I, I like the idea, but law has to say to give it rights and they won't. <laughs> well, so you would probably, to work within the law, you probably have to do some stupid traditional law thing. So um, but like, but like they, these things yeah, quite like, literally can own themselves. Um, and there is, there is already, apparently, I read something recently in the US that uh, corporations can own themselves, uh, the algorithms can own themselves, and so there is a precedent for it already. It just hasn't been done yet. And obviously you would have to have someone who's uh, altruistic enough to be like, we're gonna create the first car and free it, almost like freeing the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is one thing, it's a coffee machine. A coffee machine? Yeah, and apparently the coffee machine, you buy coffee, and the smart contract goes for paying for the refills for the coffee and maintenance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> car, but it's a coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so you can extend to anything. Like, uh, so I've written about like houses owning themselves because I think part of the reason why houses are so expensive is because we have this whole rentier class who literally just make shitloads of money off us for doing nothing, <laughs> for owning property and owning land, and we pay them all this money. Let's have a, a DAO over the property and charge us at zero profit. Like, just charge us enough to maintain itself and nothing more. Because only humans are greedy and want profit. You know, algorithms don't need profit. So yeah. Anyway. Uh, also, <laughs> this is the other, uh, more broader thing. So um, I, I, I realize that like competition is is very redundant um, for the most part. So if if you think about our entire society, you know, we're in a capitalist type system. So I used to the only other uh, in my second job I've ever had now. Uh, my first job where I got fired from because they wanted me to go from three days a week to five days a week. <laughs> and I said no. Um, so that was like a typical web design business. You know, everyone knows web design businesses. There must be 10,000, 50,000 web design businesses in the world. And what do they do? They all do the same fucking thing. <laughs> like, they make websites. Um, there were 20 people in this company. Uh, there were two guys who did the programming and two guys who did the design. The rest were admin staff, managerial staff, and salespeople who I don't think needed to exist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the same with like, I've done, cons like, so I've done consulting and contracting work and I can tell you pretty much every single organization I've ever looked at, if you, if you get into an organization, like 90% of those people don't need to be there. Um, I can tell you, you can automate them very, very easily. And, and that's just internal operations. And then you look at like, these companies are competing with each other. So, you know, a web design firm. What is a web design firm? It has its own bank account, its own brand, its own logo, its own accountant, its own lawyer, its own staff, its own office, its own all this crap. When at the end of the day, like, what, they make websites. It's the same as the other guy down the road. So I think what's going to end up happening with blockchain is you can actually have, you can platform out these things and just de decimate entire industries with single open platforms, um, which will then push the competition to the next layer. So a great example is like say insurance companies. Like, so there must be again ten thousand insurance companies around the world, each with their own marketing niche and brand. Well, decentralized insurance would quite literally decimate them in one single contract, in one smart contract, one DAO. So you would have a, a decentralized insurance platform that is this open, decentralized, impartial um, platform that control that has open data, um, open smart contracts for running all the business logic. And if you wanted to create an insurance company you would just go, I'll create an insurance company and plug in and then you've got instant access to everything else that you would need to run an insurance company. And your competitive advantage then wouldn't be, I've gone through all this regulatory crap and I've set up you know, all this like proper legal stuff and all this you know, brand and, legal and, and, all this <coughs> and all this other crap. It would be my service offers a better UX or a better UI than yours. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, <laughs> Think, think of like right now, every single, most businesses in the capitalist system pretty much survive because they have siloed data. They, they capture, control, and monopolize. So they have the network effects of owning users, owning data, and leveraging that to make a profit. Well, what happens when you, you know, when that data, when those, those users have um, 
zero switching costs. What if you could go from Facebook.com to some brand new app your friend down the street just created yesterday and have instant access to all of your friends and all of your data instantaneously? That means that you, know, you, you get rid of all of these silo businesses. Um, and you reduce competition, it pushes competition to a new layer. <coughs> Isn't it cyclic? Yeah, yeah, probably. Because you'll create a new platform. Yeah. But our, our platforms right now, like the platform we're at now is kind of like, here's Facebook's data silo, here's Snapchat's data silo, here's Instagram's data silo. You know, if you flatten out that open data platform and then you've got to push them up to the top, and if, you know, yeah, if your little brother can create a, a, an app that can compete with Facebook tomorrow, if he gets enough users uh, who want to use his platform, then sweet. Okay. Yeah. Would, a network, would a network effects exist in dApps as well? Because, yeah, yeah. Because of the token, of the whole concept of these tokens and currencies? Yeah, so, but it's, it's almost like network effects on a, on like a open platform level. So whoever creates so most of the, most of the activity in the, in the blockchain space right now are people building um, low-level platforms because there's a lot of the infrastructure just missing there. So they're building like decentralized identity, decentralized file storage, and and obviously they will have network effects. If if everyone decides that IPFS, which is a file decentralized file storage protocol, if they decide that's better than Storage or Swarm or these other ones, then then yeah, that'll win. And it'll, the more people use it, the more network effects. But at least they'll still have zero switching costs. Because <laughs> there's no lock-in, there's almost like no lock-in, there's, yeah. Um, so the other cool thing about like this whole thing that I think a lot of people don't really grasp is that with a smart contract and with anything you do on the blockchain, if you, you write it once, you deploy it once, any, like you deploy it once, you can then run it from anywhere you have an internet connection without asking permission and it will be there forever. Like whatever you deploy to the blockchain like exists forever, it'll be there beyond your death. Hopefully we don't die. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but if you do die, this thing will outlive you. So if you're looking to do a like have a lasting legacy, like like you need to be building on the blockchain. Like if you build a start, I've built probably hundreds of stars in my lifetime, and they're all dead. Uh, Meta Wine literally just sent me some stuff that he found looking through files today of previous startups I've done like ten years ago, and the, the cumulative waste of time and effort I put into those previous startups is just is like. Depressing. That's <laughs> Whereas anything I build on the blockchain and deploy the blockchain, it will always exist, like always. And because um, when you deploy that, that contract and you get that address, um, you can set it up so well, most of the time it's, it's set up so that that contract can that, that address can be used by anyone anywhere in the world for free. Can anyone so, do that now? Yeah, yeah. So it's all live now. Um, Ethereum.org. You can check it out and other, other platforms as well. Is that a good thing? Yeah, so, like I always do is you <laughs> we turn on the good shit we create into really bad shit, which is what I'm going to talk about. What about when you've got some bad shit that we cannot control, cannot shut down, cannot kill? So you just create a kind of like a, a good side of that to battle against, I guess. Like, there is some crazy shit. So, so you can, like, I can go dark on this. You can do decentralized assassination marketplaces that will never be shut down, decentralized child porn rings that will never be shut down and never found. Decentralized drug marketplaces again, and nobody shut down their account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cut on his point. So the circumstance of crypto kitties on the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah. And the t uh, the like a sheer amount of computational power it stole from the chain. Yeah. Did you say it was necessarily a good thing that they could deploy that? I think it was a good stress test of the network. Um, because it's the same thing again. Like there's, I mean, people are pushing the edges of what the network can do right now. Like. Like if you go look at it, I don't know the exact transaction time, but it's just a shit. You can't do much with it. That's why, that's why most of the people building stuff on the blockchain now are in the fintech space, because you think you've got a higher cost for each transaction because you've got to pay these miners to have an incentive to run the, the process. Um, so most things that are built on blockchain now, uh, you have to be willing to pay a cost. And so it's typically like purchases, fintech stuff. And that's that's why the, the whole, a lot of the scene right now is like it's it's, it's douchebags in suits rather than <laughs> crypto anarchists. The crypto anarchists are behind the scenes trying to make the technology really good. The people leveraging it for like I don't know, a lot of the ICOs and stuff right now, it's a lot of the fintech space. But you'll see that change over the next year or two as they work out scaling. Because when you can get down to the point where it costs basically a fraction of a cent to do anything, and it just happens instantaneously, 
like you can do some awesome stuff with that. Yeah. So, uh, what, what's the equivalent? Is there going to be an equivalent of like a DDoS attack? Uh, if just you've got a whole lot of people writing rubbish that will run forever, and, but, just, and yeah. just leveraged off itself, like we had in like a chain of events. <coughs> yeah. So, so that, that's kind of one of the, the core ideas behind gas in Ethereum. So, so in Ethereum, they set it up so that Ether, which is the cryptocurrency you all know of, that is used to buy, get to pay for gas, and gas is a computational cost. So exactly that, like it would suck if you made a smart contract that was just like a while loop, and just said, just keep doing this thing forever, and everyone just kept processing it, and it would obviously crash the network. But the way they do it is like every every single every computational process, every time you do something on there, whether that's a transaction or any type of script, it costs a little bit of gas. So it is literally costing you money to run each time. So that'll never go away, but you know, even if it gets down to a fraction of a cent and you do a while loop, it, you're still gonna run out of money. Unless you just feel like wasting a lot of money that day. So, so you the owner of who wrote the script loses money or the person who accidentally runs it? The person who runs it, yeah. So it does cost you money to deploy it because that's a process to deploy the script. But then once it's there, it's live and anyone can reuse it. And like anyone can use that again but it costs them when they make the call to it to use it. Yeah, so they're staking it on the while loop and they're out of money. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> sure. But they, they have to send money to it to be able to do something, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you said that the main issue is the need to transaction time be, to be faster, right? So how would we make something that decentralized faster, faster because like say for time seeing it, takes a bit more longer than if you say downloaded a movie from a single source, uh, you know, if it then, you know, hand you download speeds. But anyways, but isn't by nature like anything that's decentralized takes time because you've got to find out, you know, you've got to find, you know, all the people who will are yep. willing to process the information and then you've got to process it maybe from one place or another place. But how would you actually like, you know, like or any ideas on how to make it faster? Yeah, so the big thing they're looking at now is like sharding and like just the idea of like just splitting it up even further so that only small pieces of computation, computational stuff go to different miners. Um, that's a hard problem to solve. I'm not exact. I'm not. I don't know exactly what they're doing in that. Like it's a whole research topic. Um, but so, so one idea where you can actually have decentralization work better than centralization is um, distribution of files. So that, that's kind of like something that IPFS is trying to work on with the international interplanetary file storage system, where the idea is that, um, like right now, if someone wants to get a cat picture, and it's a really, really popular cat picture, um, and you get a million people trying to get that cat picture, and it's stored on a server with an IP address, like on, on AWS, you've, you've suddenly got a million people trying to access it from a central source, which, you know, if there's too many people, that's essentially a DDoS, and the server goes down. Um, in a decentralized system, the, the file, uh, in IPFS, you store the file actually on, the file uh, kind of like location isn't an IP address pointing to a server, it's literally the hash of the file, um, which means that you can, what the way it happens, I saw this awesome, the guy at Ethereum like showed this awesome kind of analogy of how it works. So rather than, so say, so say the cat picture is here um, and you're here, the first time you, you wanna get that cat picture, it kind of like bounces through some of the nodes to get it and then some of the miners and then it grabs the picture and then it goes back to this node, they keep a, co a cached copy, it goes back to this node, they keep a cached copy, they keep a cached copy, and then you get your file. And then so the next time someone else nearby you tries to get, that, get to this file, there's a cached copy here. So it actually, the more popular a file is in, this, in a decentralized file storage system, the quicker it gets to you. And each of those miners are incentivized economically to actually s store a cached copy of all the files they <coughs> recently received, if that makes sense. <laughs> So just on that, effectively what you're talking about is like Amazon Edge locations that are decentralized to various user systems. Yep. But then what about the circumstances where you start running short on nodes or validators on your chain? So you're talking about decentralization, you still need the computational power. So where you don't have enough people processing, you start having computational power needs, which slows your chain, which causes problems. Yep. Do you believe that there are any current projects that you know of that are effective net, net 3.0 projects? In um, relation to the decentralization and the effectiveness of the chain, are there any that are even approaching what would be a net 3.0? You mean like proof of concept versus proof, uh, proof of uh, stake versus proof of money? Proof of stake, proof of work, 
anything, any projects out there, you've got Nano, you've got Digibit, you've got XRP, obviously centralized. Are there any that you would say that are even broaching on the 3.0 concept for the internet? Uh, probably not, they're, like, they're all still super early. I think the only reason why people know about it and care about it is because of the money aspect. It's like the first time that we've ever had this shitload of money come into like a really early stage technology. <laughs> um, other, like if there wasn't the money aspects, if there wasn't the crypto, Bitcoin, you know, if Bitcoin wasn't the first thing that triggered this whole thing, then it would probably be just be another like underground open source movement. Like, like early Linux, where people are just like, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> but now it's like, if you've got all this, you've got the mainstream going, you know, when Lambo, when Moon, and like trying to f like force all this like techno this technology to go at a faster pace, which is good and bad. Like the technology isn't ready for for the hype. You've got this Gartner's hype curve, which is pretty common with technologies where it goes up and people are like, what's happening? Why isn't you know here's this awesome stuff that could happen, and then nothing happens because the technology doesn't move as fast as people's expectations, and then they go into this kind of like almost like a winter. I, I've I've written before that like you know perhaps there could be a crypto winter if you know. If the speculative bubble goes too high versus what the actual technology can provide in value, then people will bail and there'll be a crypto winter. And yeah. Anyway, I need to get through a lot of slides. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you got technical there for me. Um, so the other cool thing is that um, uh, if we can make this, if we can make this system like right once, um, and you have these little blocks of code, then it should be really, really easy in the future for people to build really, really complex applications by literally just dragging and dropping things, almost like putting together a recipe. Like right now you kind of have that with like node packages for anyone who's a programmer, but node packages can change and they, they break and you know, all this other crap. But imagine like node packages where they're even more condensed and tiny um, and they're all in a universal kind of communication protocol, the blockchain, and you can just kind of, once they're there, they're always there and they never break. And so you can just kind of like take this smart contract and this one and this one and this one and combine it together into a really awesome like apps that actually do something interesting. And I think if we get to that point, we can get away from the idea of this being a game for you know white elite nerds to it being a really open thing that everyone can contribute to globally. I mean, and then individuals can build their own solutions to their own problems. Yeah. How does change management work? I mean, no code ever stays the same, but once it's deployed, my understanding of blockchain is that's there like that forever. So how, how yeah. does that work? Uh, so that's a tricky one as well. So that's part of the reason why the people, uh, and, and myself included, normally in a startup you just like do hacky code and just like put it out, spaghetti shit, who cares, and then, <laughs> and then like update as you need to. But like with this, it, it costs you money to deploy to begin with, and then if you write something bad, it could like lose hundreds of millions of dollars if you've done some ICO or something. Um, I don't know exactly how people do it. I, I heard that one way they do it is just to abstract that layer away. So you have like your DAP front end, which is just like a website type thing with a JavaScript plugging into the, the, the blockchain. Um, and you just kind of point it to the new version of your, of your smart contract. So if you write a smart contract here and it's like, cool, and then you're like, oh, something's wrong with it, I've got to create a new one, create a new one, and then just point your DAP to the different address. But yeah, it's something that needs to be fixed. So is that code? that it points to still in the blockchain or is that somewhere else? Yeah, it's still on there. And you can have, I'm pretty sure you can have, you can serve smart contracts to have a function in there where you can basically um, do a call and kill it. Like basically make it inactive in some sense, even though the, the code kind of already still exists there. It's like a mortal function or something. Yeah. So it's kind of it's still <coughs> uncharted territory really. Like yeah. we're, we're, we kind of got ahead of ourselves in that way. Yeah. Great. But it would be good if you could evolve these things in as fast a way as you do with startups, yeah. Yeah, got to get through this quickly. Um, so, yeah, so basically it's building this like giant global internet. Um, like, it's literally like, almost like waking up the entire planet. Um, I, I kind of see it as like a, um, yeah, like quite literally like waking, <coughs> waking up the internet. The internet right now, as much as it's all interconnected, all the data and all the logic is in silos. It's in, it's in servers, it's in it's behind corporate doors. The blockchain and Ethereum, like they're they're a Trojan horse on capitalism, um, and all the people who are doing stuff in that know this. Um, which turns on capitalism. Sorry, what? Turns on. I mean, which is still going to run on top of capitalism. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, servers, everything. but it's freeing ownership. Until they turn it off. Yeah, yeah. You still need, yeah, we see, you still need the internet. We can, we can plug into the Starlink system that SpaceX yeah, is doing right. and all these other things. Um, and then, so, so how does this all link in with um, 
with automation, job automation. I don't know if you can see it up there, but it's like a, oh, I wrote jobs long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I actually think blockchain is probably going to be more of a, a force for automation and, a, and a more of a force for job losses than anything else. Um, because y it can be done now. It's more like logic process driven stuff. It's not nearly AI type stuff yet. I mean, when we do get to a general AI, then yes, we're all fucked. But <laughs> yeah, I think uh, blockchain is probably going to do that much faster. And so I just had a random thought, like, you know, well, in the future, maybe humans are just like a random function. <laughs> if you need randomness, just call the humans. So like, the, we, you know, there's no need for AI to kill us or, or you know, automation to basically discard us, you know, because we'll always be doing random, unexpected things, and that's always a good function for. Any type of system. <laughs> so that is like humans as a service? Yeah. <laughs> humans as a randomized function. <laughs> That's just a random thought. Um, and then, so, like, some other cool stuff I'll just quickly explain, like, what I've been trying to work on. And the crypto scene is kind of slowly catching up to some of my ideas. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've got this project called Peerism, which is all about basically transitioning to post capitalism, solving wealth inequality, and giving people income and purpose. So that we can maybe get to the point where people can just do what they want to do without having to work nine to five in a job they hate to fucking live. <laughs> it's not a shit system we're in. <laughs> um, I hope people start like really start questioning the, the system we're in. It's really fucking shit when you question it. Um, so the way I want to do that is with with school tokens. So tokenization is a massive thing in the whole crypto space. So. Tokens, cryptocurrencies, same thing. It's just a different kind of wording, and you can get around a few legal issues by calling them tokens rather than currency. Um, so skill tokens, what I want to do is have a system where um, anyone can create a, a token, a cryptocurrency essentially, um, like fidget spinning, like marketing, like design, like 3D printing, um, anything that they're passionate and interested in, and create that token once, and it needs to be created once, and then have um, a a decentralized community around that. So imagine like anyone use Reddit in the, yeah? And like so imagine, you know, subreddits. Imagine subreddits where they're interest specific communities, but imagine there's like an actual utility token attached to it where you earn tokens for um, engaging in that community, helping each other out. That essentially becomes your peer-to-peer -peer education layer. So if you really want really, really, really want to learn about 3D printing and you start off at level zero, you you've never you, you all you do is you know that the word 3D printing is cool. <laughs> then you join this 3D printing community and you can actually learn from each other, um, learn and you know, post comments, post questions, post content, feel like a subreddit, and then earn some of those 3D printing tokens for, for engaging in that community. Um, and then because these tokens are floating, there is actually an economic incentive for people to want to earn them even when they're worth nothing from day one. Because you create a token, it's pretty easy to do. If you look up ERC20 token on Ethereum, it's pretty easy to make one, but from day one they're worth nothing. Um, but because they're floating, you can have this whole community form, and you, you end up having this like little micro community, uh, micro economy. So imagine that say people really love uh, fidget spinning, and you get you know 100,000 people join the fidget spinner community, and because they want to earn the tokens and they're interested in it, and by engaging and earning tokens, um, they actually grow the size of the community, which grows the value, which grows the size of the, the value of the token, which creates this kind of flywheel effect where you end up with potentially you know. Maybe the fidget spinner microeconomy is worth $100 million. And then you've got you know, a million people in there that are ranked based on how many uh, fidget spinner tokens they've earned. And so I wrote about that about a year ago, and I met this uh, guy who was writing about a similar thing. Um, he actually works at Consensus as well, Simon uh, de la Riviere. And that whole concept has now emerged into this concept called curation markets and token curated registries. It's a very similar concept, so I'm hoping that people solve those problems so I can actually get back into it. Um, so basic idea is like let's let's quantify let's let people quantify what they're interested in, what they're good at. Then we can just have work just go straight to them. Um, get rid of all this shit where if you're if you're a freelancer, you've got to be a salesperson, a networker, a marketer. Like just have work go straight to you and just go. Yeah, looks cool. I'll take that and then get paid for it. Um, I think that's the best way to optimize our economy so that we're resilient. We have you know a thousand different skill sets and interests that are all ranked like a giant quantified resume that's decentralized rather than a system where you know you meet Bob and Bob's like, I'm an accountant, and you're like, oh man, Bob. Like, <laughs> you're like, you know he works 40 hours, oh sorry, you're an accountant. I am Bob. <laughs> you're like, I am Bob. 
<laughs> you're like, you know, he works 40 hours a week at, at an office desk, and you know, if account the accounting industry gets decimated from automation, that he's kind of screwed and has to go back to uni for four years to get a lawyer degree, and then he goes into the lawyer industry, and he's like, next year it's decimated, and he's like, oh man. <laughs> Anyway, then I'll quickly go through this. And, uh, next stage is like, okay, well, once you've got people quantified, you've got tasks coming in, they're being matched. Well, let's let's like embrace automation. Let's not um, shy away from it. The only reason why people hate automation is because it's who owns the automation. You know, if your employer, uh, your employer loves automation because it means they can get rid of your ass um, and take your your salary and put it into their profit problem. <laughs> That's the only reason people hate automation is because of the the kind of uh, the economic um, um, like social contract, I guess. Like, wh who owns the automation? Who owns the robotics? Who owns the AI? Like, we love the idea of automation, but it's 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 about who owns it and where those profits go. So let's have a system where you can actually create an economic incentive for people to create bots um, to so to automate all of our tasks that we need, but have those bots owned by no one, owned by the commons on the blockchain, because we talked about that before. Um, and have those share, those profits shared by default, um, and so that way there's actually an economic incentive for us all to create automations to literally automate all the shit we don't want to do because we all benefit in it, um, and we all share those profits. So yeah, um, links. <laughs> <laughs>